So how many citizens have been stopped for one brake light who are asked to have their car searched? And is that something that we as a society should be encouraging? We're back with the second half of our program, and we're going to start by looking at three Fourth Amendment cases the court decided this term, and one Fifth Amendment case. The first two of these involve automobiles and what a police officer may legitimately do when a traffic stop leads to a search. We just heard Justice Sotomayor pose a question in our first case. Erwin, can you tell us about the facts in this case, Hine versus United States? A police officer in North Carolina, Matt DeReese, saw a car driving with only one working brake light. He believed that North Carolina law required that a car have two working brake lights. He stopped the car to write out a ticket. As a result of the stop, a search occurred. Illegal drugs were found. But it turns out in North Carolina, a car only has to have one working brake light. So the officer's mistake is the law led to the search. And the question is, did that violate the Fourth Amendment? Lori? And it did not violate the Fourth Amendment. As the Supreme Court held that a reasonable mistake of law can be used by an officer in making the decision of whether there's reasonable suspicion or probable cause. The touchstone for the Fourth Amendment, the court said, is reasonableness. And the court has already said that a reasonable mistake of fact by a police officer can be the basis for probable cause, so why not a reasonable mistake of law. The majority found that in this case, North Carolina's brake light law was ambiguous, and therefore the officer's mistake was reasonable. Justice Kagan wrote a concurring opinion that I think is important. What she said was the test under the Fourth Amendment is always an objective one. So the subjective knowledge or state of mind of the officer isn't relevant. So it's no defense for a particular officer to say, but I didn't know of this law. She also said the word reasonable is used in different contexts with varying meanings. She said in the context of qualified immunity, reasonableness is very deferential to the officer. But she says here, under the Fourth Amendment, it's a standard of reasonableness that's much less deferential to police officers. And Justice Sotomayor wrote the lone dissent in this case, and she would not allow mistake of law to be the basis for reasonable suspicion. She says it's one thing to defer to police officers when it comes to the facts, but the law is the law and people should not be arrested. It's unreasonable to stop people for something that's not a violation of the law. That really does erode freedom in a very significant way. Okay, our second decision, Rodriguez versus United States, raised the question of whether it violated the Fourth Amendment for an officer to extend a traffic stop in order to conduct a dog sniff. The lower federal courts ruled in favor of the police and held that the Fourth Amendment was not violated because the intrusion on the driver's privacy was de minimis and therefore extending the stop for the dog sniff did not violate the Constitution. So whose side did the court come down on this time, Lori? This time the court came down on the defendant's side. In a 6-3 decision, the court found that the extended stop was a violation. That once you have a traffic stop and the officer completes what you need to do on the traffic stop, you should not be holding the person any longer without reasonable suspicion. Justice Ginsburg wrote the case referring to the famous case of Terry versus Ohio, which are these temporary detentions, and says the stop should be brief. So they they should not prolong them in order to have time to have a dog come sniff. If they do, that changes, she says, the very nature of the stop into from an ordinary traffic stop to really detecting for ordinary crime, and that would violate Indianapolis versus Edmond. Justice Alito made a practical point that I think is important in his dissent. He said the majority is seeming to create a bright line rule. A traffic stop is limited the duration necessary to get the law enforcement purpose of the traffic stop. But he said, how are courts going to be able to tell whether an officer just has slow penmanship and was slow in writing out the <laughs> ticket versus the officer was delaying the stop for purpose of the dog sniff or for purpose of getting backup to come to the scene? Well, our third and final decision, City of Los Angeles versus Patel, was a challenge to a part of the Los Angeles Municipal Code. The law required hotel and motel operators to keep records of guests for 90 days and to make those records available to police for inspection. 
Failing to keep the records or to make the records available for police inspection is a misdemeanor, punishable by up to six months in jail and a $1,000 fine. The case brought two key issues before the court. First, were facial challenges to ordinances and statutes permitted under the Fourth Amendment? And then second, whether a warrantless inspection ordinance for hotel registers violated the Fourth Amendment. Hotel and motel operators challenged the provision as authorizing warrantless inspections. And the court agreed with them, didn't it? Yes, the Supreme Court five to four ruled in favor of the hotel and motel owners. Justice Sotomayor wrote the opinion for the court. As the first issue, the court said, there can be facial challenges to statute and ordinances is violating the Fourth Amendment, just like there can be facial challenges based on any other constitutional right. And second, the court found that this ordinance was facially unconstitutional. The court said that the administrative search exception didn't apply here because there was no opportunity for pre-clearance review. Merely failing to allow the police to inspect was enough for a crime. The court said there had to be this opportunity for pre-clearance review before it became a criminal offense. And the court saw its opinion as actually rather narrow. It says that the actual law requiring that these guest records be kept, that was not unconstitutional, and that officers might be able to use the exigent circumstances exception, for example, when they're investigating whether the hotel's being used for sex workers, um, you know, that they could go ahead and get an ex parte warrant to allow the searches. But what the court said it would not allow is that closely regulated industries exception to the Fourth Amendment, and that that's probably going to be limited to, for example, firearm shops, mines, liquor sales, and other intrinsically dangerous operations. So what are the practical implications? Well, first of all, local governments are probably going to have to create some kind of administrative mechanism uh, to do the required pre-compliance rev uh, pre review. I think the case is important for courts in reaffirming that there can be facial challenges as statute ordinances violating the Fourth Amendment. I also very much agree with Laurie in terms of this narrows the scope of the administrative search exception. There is the need to have pre-compliance review, except in the very limited circumstances that the court has previously recognized. Okay. Okay, well finally, our Fifth Amendment case is Horn versus Department of Agriculture. In this case, the court had held five to four that a federal law which requires that raisin owners set aside a percentage of the crop for the federal government is a taking requiring just compensation. Here, the court stressed that because the government is taking physical possession, the government must compensate the owners for the value of the raisins. The court decided a large number of cases this term dealing with crime and punishment, and we're going to look at those next. Do you have to be an agent of the government for the Confrontation Clause to uh, kick in? Uh, based on this Court's post-Crawford uh, decisions, uh, we believe that that is the primary analysis that should be conducted. Not, not primary. I'm asking, is it, is it exclusive, that, that no person who's not an agent of the government can trigger a Confrontation Clause protection? In its 2004 decision in Crawford versus Washington, the court held that under the Confrontation Clause, out-of-court statements were not testimonial unless they were made with the primary purpose of supporting prosecution. Justice Scalia wrote that opinion, and, it has, and he has been the primary advocate for its holding on the court, as we just heard in that little bit of audio. In our next case, Ohio versus Clark, the defendant, Darius, Darius Clark, was charged with physically abusing his girlfriend's three-and-a-half-year-old son. The abuse came to light when the little boy, known to the court as LP, came to preschool with marks all over his face and was asked by his teacher who had hurt him. After some hesitation, the boy identified Clark. The teacher took LP to the school office and made a report of suspected child abuse, which eventually led to Clark being charged. Now, since LP was judged incompetent to testify because of his age, the adults who had talked to him at school were called upon to testify about what he had told them. Clark challenged his conviction as a violation of his rights under the Confrontation Clause. Did the court agree with him, Laurie? 
No, it did not. In fact, this was a unanimous decision written by Justice Alito. He ruled that the primary purpose of the statement was not testimonial. The child was too young to think that he was creating future testimony, that the main purpose for the teacher of getting the statement was to deal with an ongoing emergency and to protect the child. The fact that she might be legally required to report the statement did not make it testimonial. In fact, the court looked that historically statements made by young children out of court were not barred from testimony, and there is no categorical rule that somehow if you make a statement to a private individual who's required to report it, that becomes testimonial. Whether it's made in that context might be a factor, but frankly, statements that are made to private individuals are less likely to be testimonial. Now, you said the decision was unanimous, but in fact, there was a concurrence written by uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg uh, that took issue with the way the, um, the, the majority decision was written. Well, uh, Jim, as you noted earlier, uh, Justice Scalia has been one of the main forces behind the expansion of defendants' rights under the Confrontation Clause Crawford decision. And he was upset with dicta in this opinion uh, that he felt was designed to diminish the protection of the primary purpose test uh, from Crawford. He said the burden should not be on the defendant to show that this was the type of evidence that was historically excluded. He said the burden should be on the, the prosecution to show that this was the type of statement that historically has, has been admissible. A and he made it clear that he is concerned um, that there's a significant number of votes on the court, although not yet five, to overrule Crawford. Thank you. Executing the intellectually disabled is a violation of the Constitution's Eighth Amendment prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. Now, that was the holding in the court's 2002 decision in Atkins versus Virginia. The question in our next case, Brumfield versus Cain, was whether a defendant who raised a reasonable doubt about his intellectual disability and was denied an evidentiary hearing in state court to prove it was entitled to federal habeas relief. And what did the court decide there, Evan? Uh, well, this was another five to four decision. This time, Justice Sotomayor uh, wrote for the majority and said that the defendant in this case, Kevin Brumfield, um, did have a right to federal habeas relief under uh, 2254 uh, D2 of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, also known as EDPA. So let's look at the history of this uh, just a little bit more. The court held in Atkins versus Virginia um, that executing the intellectually disabled violates the Eighth Amendment, but it did leave to the states um, the determination of who is classified as intellectually um, disabled. Now in Louisiana, where Brumfeld, uh, Brumfield, I should say, lived, uh, the Supreme Court determined that an inmate is entitled to a full evidentiary hearing on the question of intellectual disability when, number one, uh, he has a low IQ, number two, he has a significant impairment in a variety of adaptive skills, and then number three, where he manifests a neuropsychological disorder in youth. Brumfield scored 75 on the IQ test, which is in the range established by Atkins when you take the margin of error into account. During his penalty phase, he also introduced evidence of low birth weight, uh, learning disabilities, and the fact that antipsychotic and sedative drugs had been administered to him uh, during his childhood. Um, there was some question about whether his IQ was actually higher on uh, some of the other tests, but you have to remember here that the question was not whether he was intellectually disabled, but instead whether he was entitled to an evidentiary hearing on whether he was. And given all that, what the Supreme Court looked to was Section D2 of EDPA not Section D1. And as the screen will show, Section D1 provides federal habeas relief only if the state's court's rejection of a claim was, quote, contrary to or involved an unreasonable application of clearly established federal law as determined by the Supreme Court. But Section D2 allows habeas relief if the state court's ruling was 
based on an unreasonable determination of the facts in light of the evidence presented in the state court hearing. In this situation, there was ample evidence, the court said, creating a reasonable doubt about whether Brumfeld's disability manifested into adulthood, and his IQ score was not inconsistent with the diagnosis of intellectual disability. I think this case is important because I think it will open the door to more challenges based on Atkins versus Virginia by those who have been sentenced to death. For those of less severe intellectual disabilities, say with an IQ of about 75, it means their claims are not doomed. I think there's been more opportunity under Section D2 for federal courts to review the state court fact-finding. I think in theory, this does open the door to more claims. I think in practice, I'm not sure that there's going to be, you know, a rush to the courthouse with new claims because I think just about everybody on death row with an IQ of around 75 already has a precautionary Atkins claim uh, filed. Um, I do think that there are two things that might limit the reach of this decision. Number one, uh, the reasonable doubt standard in this case came from Louisiana law. Not every state's going to have that. Uh, and then second, one of Brumfield's complaints was that the state court had denied him funds to develop his Atkins claim in post-conviction uh, proceedings. If they had given him the money to develop that Atkins claim and he had produced no more than what he actually produced, uh, the result could have been different in this case. Next, what happens in the jury room stays in the jury room, at least to some extent. Federal Rule of Evidence 606B makes certain juror testimony regarding what happened in the jury room inadmissible during an inquiry into the validity of the verdict. There are some exceptions, like Rule 606B2A, that deals with extraneous prejudicial information being properly, improperly brought to the jury's attention. But on the whole, courts don't want to hear about what jurors said, at least not from other jurors. Now, how did this come up in the case of Warger versus Showers, Lori? Now, Jim, Warger sued Shower in federal court for negligence regarding an automobile case. And during four deer, one of the jurors, Regina Whipple, said she could be fair and impartial. However, during the jury deliberations, Whipple then told her fellow jurors that she would have a hard time voting for the plaintiff because her own daughter had been in an accident where tragically a man had died, and if she had been sued, it would have ruined her life. After losing the case, Warger then went to the other jurors to get an affidavit, hopefully to get a new trial. And uh, did the Supreme Court find that that was allowed? Uh, no. Unanimously, the court ruled that the use of the affidavit was a violation of Rule 606B. Now, Warger had tried to argue that he wasn't looking into the thought process of the juror, but he was merely inquiring into the validity of the voir dire. But the court wasn't buying it. Uh, it said the exception in 606B2A doesn't apply here because the prejudicial information wasn't improperly brought to the jury's attention. Uh, it came from the general life experience of one of the jurors, which was internal to the jury. Uh, the court did reserve judgment on cases where the juror has, uh, where the juror bias that's revealed by a juror affidavit um, after the verdict is just so extreme that it actually violates the right to a jury trial. You know, frankly, I think this is a very broad prohibition on the use of affidavits by jurors. However, it does not keep judges from looking into serious improper influence on jurors from external sources, like people talking to jurors or jurors going to look things up. And don't forget that judges have other means of monitoring juror behavior. Uh, if the lies or misconduct are brought to the judge's attention while the trial's ongoing, the judge can question the juror, perhaps dismiss the juror, and the judge can always use evidence regarding juror misconduct. It just cannot come from other jurors during that deliberative process. Under the Immigration and Nationality Act, resident aliens can be deported back to their home country if they're convicted of any violation of any law or regulation of a state, the United States, or a foreign country relating to a controlled substance, as that's defined in Section two, uh, 802 of Title 21. Now, Munis Maluli was convicted in Kansas for misdemeanor possession of drug paraphernalia. In this case, that meant a sock with four Adderall in it. Uh, 
although the state complaint didn't identify the substance that was in the sock. After completing his probation for that conviction, he was ordered deported by an INS administrative judge under the law I just cited. Malouli challenged his deportation and won in the Supreme Court. Now, uh, what was the court's reasoning, Evan? Uh, that the Kansas Controlled Substance Statute contains some small number of drugs that are not on the federal controlled substance uh, schedule. The majority ruled that this discrepancy between uh, the Kansas and the federal schedules meant that Malouli's Kansas conviction didn't categorically qualify uh, for deportation. The Bureau of Immigration Affairs had ruled that drug paraphernalia uh, qualified for deportation if it related to the drug trade in general, um, and not necessarily to a substance on the federal schedule. But the majority here rejected that argument, pointing out that it could lead to cases where someone could be deported for possessing a minor item of drug paraphernalia and not actually for the drug itself. So I think what Evan said about Malouli's campus conviction not categorically qualifying him for deportation is very, very important here, because it goes to the standard that the court has adopted in Moncrief versus Holder in deciding whether an offense makes an alien removable. The court said there, and reiterates here, that an alien's actual conduct is irrelevant. Under the categorical approach, it requires that all of the convictions under a statute must trigger the removal without the inquiry into the individual case. So frankly, even if Adderall is listed as a controlled substance both by Kansas and by the United States, Malouli was convicted of a broader paraphernalia offense under the Kansas law and it has drugs that are not listed by the federal law. Drugs were also important in our next decision, McFadden versus the United States, but this time they were the so-called analog or designer drugs. Congress passed the Controlled Substance Analog Enforcement Act in 1986. Its purpose was to keep underground chemists from creating new drugs that have the same effect as drugs already explicitly prohibited by federal law. An analog has a similar chemical structure to a prohibited drug, and an actual intended stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect when it's consumed by human beings. McFadden ran a video rental store where he also happened to be selling what he advertised as bath salts. They were named things like Speed and The New Up and had effects similar to cocaine and crystal meth. But the label said they were not for human consumption and they were not controlled substances or analogs. McFadden was arrested and charged with selling designer drugs. The trial judge instructed the jurors that to convict under the Analog Act, they had to find that the defendant, and I'm quoting, knowingly and intentionally distributed a mixture of substance that has substantially similar effects on the nervous system as a controlled substance, and that the defendant intended for the mixture or substance to be consumed by humans. Now, Lori, how did this case case get to the Supreme Court? Well, McFadden wanted an instruction that in order to convict, the jury had to find that he knew that the substance he was selling was a controlled substance analog. On the other hand, the prosecutors wanted an instruction that required the jurors only to find that McFadden knew he would be selling a substance that would be used for human consumption. So the question was one of mens rea, which instruction? And what did the court decide? Well, the court decided, here's the standard, that the defendant does need to know that a substance is a controlled drug to be convicted. But to meet that requirement, you have one or two ways. One, the defendant may know that the substance was either on the controlled substance list or on the analog schedule, even if he didn't know precisely what the substance was or alternatively, that the defendant did know what the substance was, whether or not he knew it was one, one of these schedules. Evan, what's the significance of this decision? I think the bottom line is pretty clear. It means that the requisite mens rea for controlled substances and controlled substance analogs is essentially identical. I think it's also significant because it shows the court uh, is requiring intent for prosecutions, even if the statute is not explicit about that. We saw this earlier when we discussed the Alanis case. 
And I think that there are going to be some possible issues going forward here. Um, the court describes the second kind of knowledge as knowledge of the specific features of the analog and then knowledge of the identity of the analog. Those aren't the same thing. Um, so does, other, does either kind of knowledge uh, suffice? Also, if a drug possesses multiple specific features, does the defendant have to know all of those? Um, and finally, how precise does the defendant's knowledge of the identity of the drug have to be? I mean, does he have to know its proper name? Or is it enough to know that he, um, is it enough for him to know that there's some kind of imprecise street slang? All right, we also want to tell you about another decision the court reached this term, Johnson versus United States. The case involved a convicted felon who violated the federal statute that prohibited him from possessing a firearm. When he was tried for that offense, prosecutors asked for an increased sentence under what has, been, uh, has come to be known as the residual clause of the Armed Career Criminals Act, or ACCA. The ACCA allows for increased sentences when a felon's been convicted previously of three or more statutorily defined offenses as well as a crime that, and as this is the residual clause language, otherwise involves conduct that presents a serious potential risk of physical injury to another. Now the court found that language so vague that imposing an increased sentence under it violated due process. In making its ruling, the court overruled two of its precedents in James versus United States and Sykes versus United States. So tell us how significant that is, Laurie. You know, I think the group of us agree that this could be a very significant decision. I mean, the court doesn't address what we might see as petitions that are undoubtedly coming forward as to the retroactive application of this, and there could be scores of them. Yeah, and there are several federal, I think there are 10 federal statutes um, that are materially indistinguishable in their language from the one that was declared unconstitutional uh, in Johnson. So there are going to be all kinds of challenges brought. Of all the drugs involved in the court's cases this term, probably the most controversial weren't those used by the accused, but those used by the state. Specifically, I'm talking about the three-drug cocktail used to execute prisoners who've been sentenced to death. Four death row inmates in Oklahoma challenged the first of three drugs used in uh, executions as a violation of their Eighth Amendment protection against cruel and unusual punishment. The name of the case is Glossop versus Gross. The drug the inmates challenged, midazolam, is used to render the prisoner unaware of all sensation so that he won't feel the painful effects of the second two drugs that actually paralyze him and then stop his heart. The drugs that used to be used for this purpose, sodium thiopental and pentobarbital, became unavailable when death penalty advocates convinced the companies that made them to stop selling them for use in executions. The effectiveness of those two drugs wasn't questioned. But unable to acquire them, Oklahoma switched to midazolam, which the inmates in Glossop challenged as not being able to make the condemned sufficiently insensate to the pain of the remaining fatal drugs. So, Laurie, what can you tell us about the case below and the argument at the Supreme Court? Indeed, this case was over whether Medezolon was indeed unable to anesthetize the condemned so that the actual execution turned out to be cruel and unusual punishment. And it was a classic battle of the experts before the lower court. Each side had won, and there were questions raised about the research results that the state's expert had presented. And how did the court come down in this case? Uh, well, five to four, the majority ruled that the death row inmates here had failed to show that midazolam creates a substantial risk of severe pain when compared to the known and available alternatives. Um, the court found that the district court's ruling on that point was not clear error and that that was the standard that was uh, to be used. The majority relied heavily on um, a decision um, they had rendered earlier in Bayes versus Rees, which upheld the constitutionality um, of the standard three drug protocol, but which there had used sodium thiopental uh, instead of midazolam. 
And, and, you know, what the court said is that the death penalty is a constitutional penalty. It's even mentioned in the Bill of Rights. And therefore, there has to be a legal way to execute somebody. And for that reason, it put the burden on the petitioner to show that there was actually a viable alternative to the execution method that, that they wanted declared unconstitutional. Okay, now there were two major dissents here by Justices Sotomayor and Breyer. Uh, tell us something about those, Lori. Uh, Justice Sotomayor challenged the majority's opinion directly. She said that the lower court's finding was actually clearly erroneous and that there were, the testimony of the single expert by the state was absolutely implausible, given that the expert had given inconsistent prior unreliable testimony and there had never been a full hearing with findings that could be properly challenged. But she also wrote, that the majority had sort of concocted out of thin air this requirement that the petitioner show an alternative means for his own execution. In fact, she said that's not required by Bayes, and in fact, it's contrary to logic when it comes to the Eighth Amendment. So you could have a horrible means of execution, but if the prisoner's not able to identify an alternative, somehow it works with the Eighth Amendment, that she rejected. And there was another dissent, and a very notable dissent, uh, written by Justice Breyer, uh, joined by Justice Ginsburg, went much further and called for the court to reconsider uh, the constitutionality of the death penalty itself. Um, they said that the number of condemned people who have been executed only to be later vindicated um, shows that it's so unreliable as to be cruel. Uh, and because of the steep decline in the use of the death penalty and the polls that are showing uh, growing support for abolition, they argued that the death penalty is also unusual. But, you know, Justices Scalia and Thomas each wrote concurrences addressing directly Justice Breyer's arguments, saying that it's up to the democratic process to determine whether to get rid of the death penalty, not a judicial opinion. All right, and Beth, I'm told that we have an emailed question from Francis. Yes, um, the question is, it's about Johnson, and um, the question is, is what is Johnson's application, for example, in crimes of violence sentencing enhancements for illegal entry? Is it constitutional or is it limited, unconstitutional when using the residual um, provision for armed career offenders? Well, the residual clause uh, for uh, crime of violence is worded slightly differently than the residual clause um, that was struck down in Johnson. It speaks um, of a substantial risk that force will be used. But the question is going to be, is that a material distinction? I think it would be hard for courts with a straight face to say that there's any real difference between the two. So I think the, the courts are definitely going to see challenges to that. And now some decisions directly affecting the federal courts. Would you tell me first what difference there is, if any, pursuant to your reasons, <clears throat> that would not apply to a consolidated case for all purposes, number one, and number two, isn't a case consolidated with others for purposes of pretrial proceedings a pending action that involves multiple parties? There's probably no aspect of American life more affected by Supreme Court decisions than the federal courts themselves. Sitting atop the federal judiciary, the justices have the final word on how the lower courts function. There are a number of decisions this term highlighting that aspect of the court's job. And as you just heard in that question from Justice Sotomayor, the issues in this area can sometimes be quite technical. Before we talk about our first decision, Susanna, can you tell us a little bit about the Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation? Of course. The Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation uh, is authorized by federal law to transfer civil actions that involve common questions of fact, transfer them from the courts in which they've been brought to any district for coordinated or consolidated pretrial proceedings. This is under 28 U.S.C. section 1407. And the purpose is essentially efficient adjudication of the cases. And cases can also be, and sometimes are, uh, consolidated for pre not just for pretrial proceedings, but also for trial and disposition. So in Gelboim versus Bank of America, um, 
this is a case that was brought in the Southern District of New York. It was consolidated with 60 other cases that had uh, begun in different districts, but uh, you know they raised uh, one or more common questions of fact. Gelboim's case raised a single claim that a number of banks acting together had violated federal antitrust law. Uh, the district court dismissed Gelboim's case on the grounds that the plaintiffs had suffered no antitrust injury. Um, but when Gelboim tried to appeal that decision to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, that court dismissed the appeal for want of jurisdiction. The circuit court ruled that because other cases which were discrete from Gelboim's, uh, but which had been consolidated for you know pretrial purposes, were still before the district court there, uh, and there had not been a final judgment in Gelboim's case, and it was not yet ripe for appeal under 28 U.S.C. Uh, 1291. So what did the Supreme Court say? The court said that cases that are consolidated for pretrial proceedings still retain their separate identity and they're not melded. So the dismissal of this single case is a final order for that case and the case can be appealed. But Suzanne, I think that it's important to note that the court did reserve the question of whether the same rule would apply to cases that are consolidated for all purposes rather than just for pretrial proceedings. Okay. Well, our next case is actually two cases decided together by the court, U.S. versus Wong and U.S. versus June. Both involve the Federal Torts Claim Act, or the FTCA. That law waives U.S. sovereign immunity and allows a tort claim to be brought against it. The FTCA provides in part that a tort claim against the United States shall be forever barred unless it's presented to the appropriate federal agency within two years after the claim accrues and then brought to federal court within six months after the agency acts on the claim. June missed the two-year deadline because she claimed the government concealed vital facts until it was too late. And then Wong missed the six-month deadline in her case because she claimed the district court did not let her file until after the deadline for filing. So, Evan, what was the issue before the court? Well, both Wong and June were requesting equitable tolling of the deadlines. So the question before the court was um, whether those deadlines could be tolled or whether they instead um, were jurisdictional. Here the court relied on its 1990 decision in uh, Irwin versus uh, Department of Veteran Affairs. Uh, which created a rebuttable presumption in favor of finding statutory uh, time limits non-jurisdictional and therefore subject to equitable tolling uh, in suits against the government. Uh, the government had argued that the presumption ha uh, was rebutted because Congress meant for the time bar to be jurisdictional, but the court rejected that argument because uh, most statutes of limitations and other time hurdles are not jurisdictional, and the court said that the, that, that, that can only, the presumption can only be overcome by evidence of Congress's clear intent to create a jurisdictional bar, and there wasn't that evidence here. I think that's particularly significant for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, the FTCA is a waiver of federal sovereign immunity, which means that it's defining what kind of jurisdiction the federal courts can have uh, in those suits. So one could argue that those time limitations are meant to cabin that jurisdiction. Second, the Irwin decision uh, came some years after the FTCA was passed, so Congress wasn't writing the law with the Irwin presumption uh, in mind, which means that the court's decision signals a broad application of the Irwin rebuttable presumption um, holding to federal statutes with time limits, uh, even when they use strong language like shall forever be barred. And I think that, that language leads to an interesting part of this decision, um, and that's the majority's treatment of a different precedent. So beginning in 1883, the court has consistently held that the statute of limitations in the Tucker Act, which applies to non-tort suits against the U.S. Uh, United States, it, that one is jurisdictional, and so it's not subject to equitable tolling. And that act, the Tucker Act, uses the same shall be forever banned uh, language that's found in the Federal Tort Claims Act. Uh, 
But in more recent cases, the court has essentially limited that precedent to the Tucker Act, allowing statutes of limitations to be told in uh, subject to equitable tolling in other cases, which makes these Tucker Act cases really quite an outlier on the issue of equitable tolling. Okay. Well, since the court's 1986 decision in Batson versus Kentucky, prosecutors have not been allowed to exercise their peremptory challenges to prospective jurors on the basis of race. If defense lawyers suspect that that's happening, they can challenge the prosecutor's strikes, and if the government's lawyer cannot provide a race-neutral reason for his or her choices, they can't stand. So, Susanna, how did the Batson decision figure in our next decision, Davis versus Ayala? Well, in Hector Ayala's trial, murder trial, the prosecutor struck all of the black and Hispanic prospective jurors using peremptory challenges. The defense challenged those strikes, and the trial judge allowed the prosecutor to explain the reasons, give race-neutral reasons, in chambers without the defense counsel being present. This was supposedly so that the prosecution didn't have to tip its hand as to its trial strategy. Uh, the judge accepted the prosecution's reasons. Ayala was tried, he was convicted and sentenced to death. The California Supreme Court on appeal found that if the exclusion of defense counsel from the Batson hearings was error at all, it was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. The Ninth Circuit dis on habeas disagreed. They granted Ayala habeas because there was, they said, a sufficient chance that had the defense been present, they would been, the defense counsel would have been able to challenge, successfully challenge, uh, some of the peremptory strikes. So, Evan, what did the Supreme Court say about the situation? The uh, Supreme Court held that the Court of Appeals failed to accord sufficient deference um, to the California Supreme Court's finding of harmless error. Uh, the majority disapproved of the uh, panel's uh, speculations about what extra information that defense counsel might have um, raised if he had been present, said the correct standard for harmless error in federal habeas cases uh, where the court has adjudicated the merits um, on the issue um, is found in the Supreme Court's 1993 decision in Brecht versus Abrahamson, uh, which subsumes the standard laid out by Congress in AEDPA. I think one of the most important and interesting opinions in this case may turn out to be what Justice Kennedy wrote even though it had nothing to do with the subject of the decision. He said, Ayala having been condemned to spend a long period of time in solitary confinement might have been cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. And many commentators have read Justice Kennedy's opinion here suggesting that at least Justice Kennedy and perhaps other justices are open to a claim that long periods of time in solitary confinement constitutes cruel and unusual punishment in violation of the Eighth Amendment. Thank you. Okay. Well, the rights of prisoners in pretrial detention was the focus of our next decision, Kingsley versus Hendrickson. Michael Kingsley was being held on a drug charge in a Wisconsin County jail prior to trial. When he refused the orders of a guard several times, three more officers were called in to make sure he had complied. Kingsley continued to resist, and the officers used various physical means to restrain him. At one point, they used a taser gun on him, and he claimed, although they denied, they slammed his head into a brick bunk. Kingsley brought a Section 1983 claim against the officers for excessive force. At the end of the trial, the district court instructed the jury that excessive force meant force applied recklessly. That is unreasonable in light of facts and circumstances at the time. The jury found in favor of the officers, but then, Susanna, what happened? Well, the question before the Supreme Court was what had to be proved for a 1983 claim of excessive force? Does the pretrial detainee uh, have to prove that the alleged offending officer meant to use that level of force, that is, that there was some subjective state of the officer's mind, or does the detainee only have to prove that a, an objective standard, that is, that a reasonable officer in the defendant's position would have recognized that this particular use of force was excessive? Yeah, and along those lines, the majority uh, said that the trial court should not have used the term recklessly uh, in the jury instructions because that connotes some kind of subjective uh, component, such as the conscious awareness of an unjustifiable risk of harm. 
Um, but the court qualified its decision somewhat, didn't it, Susanna? Yes. Justice Breyer said that the courts couldn't apply the standard mechanically. That is, the objective reasonableness of the use of force depends on the facts and circumstances of the particular case, and that determination of reasonableness has to be made from the perspective of, the, of a reasonable officer on the scene at the time, including only what the officer knew at the time and not including things with 2020 hindsight that the jury may know. Yeah, and so what we get is a multi-factor test, um, which the court says is a non-exclusive list of factors that should be uh, considered, uh, some of which had been cited by the district court as well. And uh, we're going to put that up on the screen. Uh, those factors uh, included the relationship between the need for the use of force and the amount of force used, the extent of the plaintiff's injuries, any effort made by the officer to limit the amount of force, the severity of the security problem at issue, the threat reasonably perceived by the officer, and whether the pretrial detainee was resisting. Now, the majority said that if the force was objectively unreasonable under this test, then it per se quote unquote, amounts to punishment, which the court held was impermissible in its 1979 decision in Bell versus Wolfish. We should note that the court acknowledged that the holding in this case may raise questions about the continued use of the subjective test, subjective standard in Eighth Amendment cases um, of excessive force claims against prison guards, but the court puts the issue off. Okay. Well, finally, we get to the case of Wellness International Network versus Sharif. This was one of the most anticipated decisions of the term because it dealt with a question of bankruptcy jurisdiction that had been in the federal courts since the court's 2011 decision in Stern v. Marshall. I had an opportunity recently to talk to Prof Professor Michelle Harner about the important implications of this decision for the bankruptcy courts, as well as to talk about some other bankruptcy decisions reached by the High Court this term. We're going to bring you that conversation in just a few minutes. But before we close out this discussion, we're going to talk about some implications of Wellness versus Sharif for the federal courts in general. Evan, can you tell us a little about the background of this decision? Well, the background is the decision that you mentioned, yeah. Stern versus Marshall. Uh, district, uh, appellate, or circuit court judges, Supreme Court justices are all Article III judges uh, whose powers and authority derive from Article III of the United States Constitution. They enjoy life tenure, uh, compensation that can't be diminished during their time of service. Uh, bankruptcy judges, on the other hand, are Article I judges um, whose authority and jurisdiction is given to them by Congress um, under its Article I powers, and bankruptcy judges serve for a term of years and not for life. In Stern, the Supreme Court held that Congress had violated Article III by authorizing bankruptcy judges to decide certain claims for which litigants are constitutionally entitled to an Article III adjudication. Wellness versus Sharif presents the question of whether Article III allows bankruptcy judges to adjudicate, to adjudicate such claims if the litigants consent. And how did the court come down on this question, Susanna? The court held that bankruptcy judges can adjudicate these claims as long as the parties consent to their doing so. Um, the court said that this particular uh, adjudication didn't threaten Article III values because the bankruptcy judges are under the supervision of district court judges, and because by giving the bankruptcy judges these powers, Congress wasn't acting to humble the federal judiciary or aggrandize itself. Justice Sotomayor specifically says that implied consent is sufficient. I think the key question in the future for bankruptcy courts and magistrate judges, and therefore for district court judges, is going to be what's sufficient to constitute implied consent. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have my discussion with Professor Harner on the bankruptcy implications of the wellness decision and also about a number of other bankruptcy opinions. Hello, Michelle. It's great to see you. Um, thanks for stopping by to talk with us about this term's bankruptcy cases. Um, we're, of course, going to start with wellness um, 
because that's the case everybody was waiting for. Um, it had a great potential for affecting the entire bankruptcy system as well as the role of magistrate judges. I'm going to talk with the full panel about wellness too, but wanted to talk with you about the bankruptcy implications of the decision. Can you just tell us about the decision and what you think is in store? Absolutely, and first, thank you, Beth, for having me today. Mm -hmm. I look forward to chatting about the cases. So wellness was very much anticipated by the bankruptcy community. It is the third of three cases in which the Supreme Court in the past several years has addressed a bankruptcy court's authority to resolve matters pending in the bankruptcy case. The first case was the Stern v. Marshall case in 2011. And that case, I think it's fair to say, threw the bankruptcy community for a little bit of a loop. In that case, the Supreme Court held that a core matter in certain circumstances could not be resolved by a final order of the bankruptcy court. That was startling for some because core matters are statutorily identified in Title 28, Section 157, and the assumption always has been, for the most part, that those matters are central to the bankruptcy case and a bankruptcy court, as a result, can resolve them by final order. Along comes the Stern decision, and you have the Supreme Court saying that assumption's not necessarily true in all instances. You may have a core matter that the statute says the bankruptcy court can resolve by final order, but the Constitution limits that authority. So you had three issues coming out of Stern. What exactly were these quote, stern core claims that were statutorily authorized but constitutionally limited, and then whether or not bankruptcy courts could treat those really as non-core claims and either decide them by final order with consent of the parties or resolve them by proposing findings of fact and conclusions of law to the district court to review de novo. After Stern, Court struggled with that issue, and not surprisingly, the Supreme Court took up another case in the executive benefits decision handed down last term. In executive benefits, we had all of those issues. What is a stern claim? Can it be resolved by consent? And do proposed findings and conclusions of fact work? The Supreme Court resolved executive um, benefits on a very narrow basis looking at Section 157 and deciding that the statute allowed the bankruptcy court to resolve the claim if it were a stern claim by proposed findings and conclusions of law. That brings us to the current term and the wellness decision, which the court granted cert on almost immediately after it handed down executive benefits. And we still had the two open issues. What exactly is a stern claim? And if you have a stern claim, does consent resolve the constitutional issue that concerned the court in Stern. And the wellness decision is a 6-3 decision, and the majority held pretty clearly that consent, knowing and voluntary consent, is sufficient to allow the bankruptcy court to resolve it by final order, even if it is a Stern claim. There's an interesting dissent by Thomas and an interesting dissent by Roberts, but I think for immediate purposes, wellness at least narrows the issues that we're struggling with. So after wellness, what you have is if it's a core claim, the bankruptcy court can resolve it by final order. If it's a non-core claim, the bankruptcy uses either consent or proposed findings and recommended conclusions of, of law. And if you have this kind of ambiguous stern core claim, Voluntary and knowing consent, expressed or implied, and the court makes that clear, mm -hmm. is sufficient to resolve any constitutional concerns, at least according to the majority. The ambiguity exists as to what exactly is a stern claim and what happens if the parties will not consent, but I have confidence that the bankruptcy courts through local rules um, will figure out a way to handle those matters efficiently. Okay, and I suspect we'll hear from the um, National Rules Committee about this as well sometime soon. Absolutely, not only on how to handle those stern claims when you do not have consent, but certainly on how we can efficiently um, identify consent early in the proceedings so that the matters can go forward without hesitation. Right. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to the next case, which I think is actually the next most anticipated cases yes. because it also has some um, great potential for implications, um, and that is Bank of America versus Coquette. 
And in this case, the two Chapter 7 debtors both had mortgages secured by a senior lien and a junior lien that was owned by Bank of America. Right. And the senior liens um, were greater than the value of the houses. Um, and so both debtors sought to um, void the lien, the junior lien, um, under 506D because it was completely underwater. Um, what did the court say about voiding junior liens that were completely underwater? It's an interesting decision, Beth, because here it's a unanimous decision, save a footnote. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll in, talk that, about that. in that respect, we have a 6-3 on the footnote. But the decision itself as to the holding was unanimous. And according to the court, it was a pretty easy case because they looked back to the 1992 decision in Doonsnip where the Supreme Court said in Chapter 7, I think it's important to recognize this is a Chapter 7 case, when you're talking about lien stripping under Section 506D, the definition of secured claim for that section is different than in other parts of 506. And so when you're thinking about 506D, you've got two questions. Is it an allowed claim? And is it secured by a lien with recourse to specific collateral? And if you answer yes to both of those questions, you cannot strip under 506D. And so the court said, that really answers the question. You can't strip an, you know, a partially secured claim, and you can't strip a wholly secured claim because that wholly, I'm sorry, unsecured right. claim, because that wholly unsecured claim is still, quote, an allowed claim under 502 that is secured by lien with recourse to collateral within the meaning of 506D. So after- Even if it has no value. <laughs> even if it has no value, in Chapter 7 right now, following the Bank of America decision, you cannot strip off from collateral either a lien that is partially secured or wholly unsecured. So how is this gonna affect debtors who are contemplating bankruptcy and mortgage lenders too? You know, I, I think it certainly will factor into the decision of debtors because we have the 1993 Nobleman decision mm -hmm. which addressed secured claims in the Chapter 13 context, specifically with respect to that anti-modification provision in 1322. And in Nobleman, it focused on a different section of 506, 506A, mm -hmm. and was very clear. We're talking about an interaction of 506A and 1322. And how courts have subsequently interpreted noblemen is that you can strip off a wholly unsecured lien, junior lien, on a residential mortgage despite the anti-modification provisions. And interestingly, the Bank of America decision from the court this term says nobleman is not really relevant here. So I think there is a suggestion that 13s proceed as they have been. Now I should note there's a court a court mm -hmm. split in 13s as to whether or not Dune Snip mm -hmm. applies. But for a debtor with a home, this could make a huge difference as to whether you file a, a 7 or a 13, and it may encourage more 13s. For lenders, junior lenders now have a much stronger seat at the table. They're going to have a say in valuations, in short sales, in distributions based on the value of the collateral because even if they're wholly unsecured based on a particular valuation on a particular date, according to the Chapter 7 ruling from Bank of America, their state law package of rights still allow them to have a lien in that particular piece of collateral that can't be stripped in Chapter 7. Okay. Well, let's talk about the footnote for a minute. Okay. Um, do you think that the court would have ruled, overruled Duesnip if they'd been asked to do that? I wish I had a crystal ball, right? In mm -hmm. hindsight, it's always 2020, but certainly Thomas's discussion of the criticism that was launched against Doonesnip almost immediately follow, following its issuance in 92 suggests that he was intrigued, at least, by the notion of just overruling it because it really cornered the Supreme Court into the holding that came down in Bank of America. They had interpreted the term secured claim one way in 506D according to Doonesnip and another way under 506A in Nobleman and Thomas and the majority didn't feel they could go back to 506A to perhaps save the argument that would have allowed the stripping of the unsecured claim from the, the collateral in the case. So there's a suggestion they would overrule it, but again, you have three who would not join that, that footnote, you know, highlighting the criticism. So we may see this again because of the split in the circuits, um, the Chapter 13 issue. We may see it again, certainly in the 13 context, because we do have a split. 
we also may see someone try to challenge Stu Snip and, and take Thomas up on, on that footnote, but I think we'll see the 13 challenge before that. Okay. Okay. Well, let's move on to Baker Botts versus Arsco. Yes. Um, th in this case, um, it was a chapter, thir I mean, excuse me, a chapter 11 case, um, and the debtors had hired two law firms to help them with their role as debtor in possession. Mm -hmm. um, the law firm successfully um, um, prosecuted two fraudulent transfer claims um, against actually Arsco's parent company. Um, Arsco went on to reorganize and repay all of its debt. Um, but then, according, in accordance with the rules, um, the two law firms filed a fee app. And that's where this whole issue came up. Right. Um, the Arsco objected to the fee application. Um, and it's worth noting that Arsco was now back under control of its parent company that had lost um, the fraudulent transfer claims. Right. Um, but ultimately, the bankruptcy court um, authorized, I think it was $140 million um, of attorney's fees. Um, they gave a $4.1 million enhancement fee for um, superior s service, mm -hmm. and then they gave $5 million for the time the two law firms spent in defending the fee application. And it's that part, the fee application um, award, that was at the crux of this case. Mm -hmm. What did the Supreme Court say about that? So in a six to three ruling, we have a lot of six to three decisions yeah. here, the majority held that professionals in the Chapter 11 setting cannot be compensated for defending their fee applications. And the majority is interesting. It starts with the American rule that litigants mm -hmm. have to pay their own fees and costs, that we do not shift fees in the litigation set setting absent an expressed statutory authorization shifting fees or a contract that would bind the party to pay those fees. And from the American rule, the majority looked to Section 330A of the Bankruptcy Code, which is the relevant statute when you're thinking about compensation of retained professionals in Chapter 11, and said what the statute authorizes is reasonable compensation for actual and necessary services. And the court didn't find any express authorization to overrule the American rule in that context, and also was very troubled by the term services and trying to fit in defending a firm's fee application as a service that benefited the bankruptcy estate. Interestingly, the dissent didn't really have an issue with that and had a very different perspective, starting with a statutory interpretation and saying you can't stop at Section 330A1. You have to look at all of the compensation provision in Section 330, and 330A3 allows the court to consider other factors relevant to the services provided by the professional. And at least according to the dissent, defending a fee application, given the way the bankruptcy court's allowed to review and approve fees, certainly could be a relevant factor in, in awarding reasonable compensation. But the majority did win out the day, so presently you can be compensated for preparing your fee application, which is allowed by 330A6, but you cannot be compensated for defending it if it's challenged. So in the bankruptcy sort of trade literature, yes. a lot's been written about the implications of this decision. What, what has been said and what do you think is going to happen? So I, I think from someone not who's not familiar with the bankruptcy system, the decision may make a whole lot of practical sense, but the concern from the bankruptcy community is that fee applications and challenges to fee applications are part of an overall strategy in the bankruptcy case, right? Parties may choose to object to a fee application to gain a particular advantage in a, in a matter in the case. There also could be ramifications as to the quality of lawyers attracted to serve bankruptcy uh, debtors because of the stringency of submitting your fees for review and subject to challenge, as well as costing for debtors who have to pay for these services. So there could be consequences that aren't necessarily seen by professionals in other litigation settings that are very unique to the bankruptcy setting. And as you say, the, the commentary and, and trade rags have been surmising as to what may fall from the Baker Botts decision. But we do now have a very clear line from which the bankruptcy courts can decide as to reasonable compensation for fee applications. Okay. Um, well, the next case is Bullard versus Blue Hills. Um, and this is a relatively straightforward case in which the court held that the bankruptcy court's order denying 
um, confirmation of a Chapter 13's proposed repayment plan mm -hmm. was not an order that was immediately appealable. Right. Explain the court's reasoning and where that leaves us. The Supreme Court here, unanimous decision, took a very straightforward approach to analyzing finality in the terms of a bankruptcy court's order. And they said, like, unlike other civil contexts, you have to realize that bankruptcy cases are really an amalgamation of several different disputes, right? There's a variety of proceedings and contested matters happening in any one given case. And so really what you're looking for is whether or not the order of the bankruptcy court resolves all of the discrete legal issues presented to it. And in the context of a repayment plan in Chapter 13, an order confirming that plan, the Supreme Court said certainly is final and subject to appeal as a matter of right. But an order denying confirmation is not final because the debtor has the ability to amend the plan. And so all of the discrete legal issues presented by that particular proceeding in the bankruptcy case itself is not finally resolved by the court's order. And your question about what does that translate to other chapters, I think when you're dealing with a plan, so chapter 12, chapter 11, you are going to see similar issues and have them addressed in a similar way. Because again, if an, a confirmation of a chapter 11 plan is denied, the debtor certainly has the ability to revisit it and propose an amendment and, and try again. So I would expect there to be um, extensions, at least you know, by analogy to the other chapters that have plans that are subject to review amendment and, and then appeal once confirmed. Yeah, we could talk more about this case. I found it very interesting, some of the just commentary about the bankruptcy court um, yes. in it. But let's move on to the last case because I think we um, need to. Um, and that's Harris. It's also a very straightforward case. Um, in this case, um, a Chapter 13 debtor exercised its right to, um, excuse me, um, exercise its right to convert to Chapter 7. Yes. I um, mean, at the time of conversion, the Chapter 13 trustee had some post-petition wages of the debtors in its possession. And so the issue was what to do with that money in the possession of the Chapter 13 trustee. What did the court decide and what do you think is going to happen from here? What's so again, to a non-bankruptcy audience, the decision of a unanimous Supreme Court that the debtor was entitled to receive the post-petition wages that were in the possession of the Chapter 13 at the time of the conversion may seem surprising, but it's not when you think about the distinction between Chapter 7 and Chapter 13, which is voluntary. So in the Chapter 7 case, a debtor gets to keep his or her post-petition wages. We believe that's important to the fresh start granted by the bankruptcy discharge in the 7. But in the Chapter 13 case, the debtor has to submit at least a portion of his or her post-petition wages to payment of the rehabilitation plan. So the Chapter 13 tr trustee gains possession. Well, under Section 348 of the Bankruptcy Code, once the decision to convert the case from the 13 to the 7 is made, the only property of the, quote, estate is property that would have been property of the state on the date of the filing, the original petition date. And if you file a seven, those post-petition wages are not property of the estate. So the order simply says, trustee, you should have taken the post-petition wages you still had in your possession and given them back to the debtor. And the, co the court also hints that Chapter 13 trustees can avoid what looks like to be a windfall to a bankruptcy debtor by perhaps being a little bit more efficient in the distribution of payments to creditors under the Chapter 13 plan prior to conversion. And even suggest, and I've seen this in the commentary since, that creditors could ask for a payment schedule so that the creditors who want to make sure they're receiving payments due under the Chapter 13 plan, and if there's a con conversion there's not this large pot of undistributed proceeds, could request a, a schedule that would require the Chapter 13 to make more timely payments to avoid the situation we saw in Harris. Yes, because in this case, there was about a year's worth of money yes. there. And so yeah. it did look like a windfall. But if the tr Chapter 13 trustee had made payments all along, it wouldn't have looked that way. Absolutely so, correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, f um, for all of your commentary. And I look forward to doing this again. Thank you, Beth. That's our program for this year. We hope you found it interesting and useful. There's a link to an online survey on this page, and we hope you'll take just a few minutes now to fill it out. It's the only way for us to know what you liked about the program, what you didn't like, and what you would like to see us do differently in the future. I thank our faculty for their thoughtful discussion, and you for watching and taking part in it. I'm John Cook. Goodbye. <music>